Happy halfway. We just passed the midway point of Solutions to Physics GREGR0877. Picking up where we left off, number 51. True statements about the absorption and emission of energy by an atom include which of the following? Number one, an atom can only absorb photons of light that have certain specific energies. Number two, an atom can emit photons of light of any energy. Number three, at low temperature, the lines in the absorption spectrum of an atom coincide with the lines and it's emission spectrum that represent transitions to the ground state. So number one is correct. That is the quantum part of nature and includes Planck's constant. Number three is also correct. The absorption jumps an electron from E1 to E2 while in the ground state. Transitions to the ground state would be the lowest emission possible and would be from E2 to E1, the opposite of above. Uh, so the photons absorbed or emitted would therefore coincide. Uh, number two is false because atoms can only emit photons that are equal to the difference between the energy levels. For example, uh, E3 minus E2 equals HF. So that means that our answer is one and three only, letter D. 52, x-rays of wavelength lambda equal 0.25 nanometers are incident on the face of a crystal at angle. Uh, theta measured from the crystal surface. The smallest angle that yields an intense reflected beam is theta equals 14.5 degrees. Which of the following gives the value of the interplanar spacing D? And the, the problem also gives a sign of 14.5 degrees equals about one fourth. So we're going to use Bragg's law where 2D sine theta equals N lambda. And the smallest angle means n equals 1. So sine of theta, they already gave us, equals 0.25. So just plug in our numbers. Our d equals 0.25 nanometers divided by 2 times 0.25, and that equals 0.5 nanometers. That is answer C. 53, astronomers observe two separate solar systems, each consisting of a planet orbiting a sun. The two orbits are circular and have the same radius r. It is determined that the planets have angular momenta of the same magnitude l about their suns and that the orbital periods are in the ratio of 3 to 1, i.e. t1 equals 3t2. The ratio m1 divided by m2 of the masses of the two planets is, so the angular momentum of the planets are the same. So that means m1 v1 r equals m2 v2 r. So um, again, the same radius, we can drop that from each side. So M1 V1 equals M2 V2. So let's remember that the period equals the circumference of a circle divided by the velocity equals two pi R divided by V. Remember T1 equals three T2. So V2 divided by V1 equals three. So M1 V1 equals three times M2 V1. So that means M1 divided by M2 simply equals three and that is letter D. Problem number 54, if the sun were suddenly, re suddenly replaced by a black hole of the same mass, it would have a Schwarzschild radius of 3,000 meters. What effect, if any, would this change have on the orbits of the planets? Uh, this is my favorite problem in this exam. So the force of gravity equals gmm over r squared, where r is the distance from the planet to the center of mass of the black hole or the sun. Since r, that distance to the center of mass of the black hole or the sun doesn't change, and neither do either of the masses, they all stay the same, so the force of gravity. So there's no change in the orbits, and so that would be answer E. And interestingly, I want to just take you on a thought experiment. If the sun were not replaced with a black hole, but let's just say it was taken away permanently, then the orbits of the planets, because the sun is several light minutes away, they would stay the same for several minutes because the force of gravity, uh, the change in the gravitational field would not have an impact on the planets for several minutes. And so you can see from that that we feel the gravity from the past. So if we feel the gravity from the past because of hot big bang cosmology, uh, we're feeling, in essence, the gravity from the Big Bang. We're feeling distant locations as they were in the past. And remembering back to an earlier problem, the temperature of the universe was hotter in the past. So if you account for all that extra heat energy from the past that we're feeling just now because of the finite speed of gravity, interestingly enough, 
it equals dark energy. Um, so I included a link to a video that I made on YouTube about it if you're interested in checking it out. And here's a little more detailed of an explanation of what I'm talking about that is an abstract that I had published with the American Mathematical Society. Anyway, so let's just continue with the exam. And number 55, a distant galaxy is observed to have its hydrogen uh, beta line shifted to wavelength to a wavelength of 580 nanometers away from the laboratory value of 434 nanometers. Which of the following gives the approximate velocity of recession of the distant galaxy? And the GRE uh, ETS is generous enough to give us that 580 over 434 equals about four thirds. So we're gonna use the relativistic Doppler effect equation where lambda observed over lambda emitted equals four thirds equals uh, the quantity of one plus V over C divided by the quantity one minus V over C, that whole quantity square root. So let's just square each side and um, squaring four thirds, 16 over nine equals one plus V over C, that quantity divided by one minus V over C. So do some algebra, 16 minus 16 V over C equals nine plus nine V over C and that equals seven over 25 equals V over C, seven over 25 equals 0.28 and that is answer A. 56, a small plane can fly at a speed of 200 kilometers per hour in still air. A 30 km kilometer per hour wind is blowing from west to east. How much time is required for the plane to fly 500 kilometers due north? So let's look at our diagram. So if we're flying in still air, that means we're flying with the wind not impacting us. So if the wind is going from west to east at 30 kilometers per hour and we're flying an angle theta that gives us a um, zero impact from the wind at 200, km, milli, 200 kilometers per hour, then our velocity in the y direction is what? Noting that we're going across c squared, applying the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, we're going across the hypotenuse at 200 uh, kilometers per hour. So let's apply Pythagorean's theorem, v squared equals 200 kilometers per hour, that quantity squared minus 30 kilometers per hour, that quantity squared. So again, we're gonna do some algebra. We're gonna take the square root of each side and we're gonna say that V equals 10 times the square root of 391. And remembering that velocity times time, times time equals distance. Our distance we wanna know is 500 kilometers. So therefore our time equals our distance divided by our velocity in the y direction and so that was 10 times the square root of 391 kilometers and so 10 into 500 is 50 answer D. Number 57 each of the figures above shows blocks of mass 2m and m acted on by an external horizontal force F. For each figure which of the following statements about the magnitude of the force that one block exerts on the other F12 is correct. Assume that the surface on which the blocks move is frictionless. So first we're going to apply Newton's second law F equals ma and our total force therefore equals 3ma and that's the 2m plus m. Then we're going to apply Newton's third law equal and opposite forces. So in figure one the force the big block exerts on the small block equals the force the small block exerts back. So the force of the small block equals ma equals one third f total. That one third coming from the fact that it has one third of the total mass. In figure two, the force the small block exerts on the big block equals the force the big block exerts back. So f of b equals two ma equals two thirds of the total force. Remembering that the total force was three ma. And so that is answer B. 58, in the figure above, block A has mass M subscript A equals 25 kilograms, and block B has mass M subscript B equals 10 kilograms. Both blocks move with constant acceleration A equals two meters per second squared to the right, and the coefficient of static friction between the two blocks is US equals 0.8. The static frictional force acting between the blocks is, so since the blocks are stuck together, block B accelerates to the right with a force of F equals MA equals 10 kilograms times two meters per second squared, that equals 20 newtons. 
So in order for them to remain stuck together, the frictional force is therefore equal to 20 newtons in this situation. It would be zero if there's no acceleration to the right, and it could be as high as 78.4 newtons given enough acceleration. So that's because the max uh, static frictional force that would keep them stuck together would be uh, umg, and that would equal 78.4 newtons. Um, but static friction, you only need the amount to stay stuck together of the amount that you are applying. So in this case, we're applying 20 newtons of force to the right, and so 20 newtons A is keeping the block stuck together. 59, a simple pendulum of length L is suspended from the ceiling of an elevator that is accelerating upward with constant acceleration A. For small oscillations, the period T of the pendulum is, and the small, the small angle simple pendulum T equals two pi times the square root of the length divided by the uh, g, and g being the acceleration of gravity. Since the acceleration of the reference frame is going up, it produces an acceleration on the pendulum in the same direction as gravity, uh, which is down. So the acceleration needs to be added to the acceleration of gravity since g in this problem is positive. Uh, just as a note, if it were accelerating downwards, it would be g minus a instead of g plus a. And so in our case, the answer to number 59 is going to be C. Number 63, long straight wires in the XZ plane, each carrying current I, cross the origin of cord uh, the at, cross at the origin of coordinates as shown in the figure above. Let x hat, y hat, and z hat denote the unit vectors in the x, y, and z directions respectively. The magnetic field B as a function of x with y equals zero and z equals zero is. So the magnetic field in the x direction is going to equal u o i sine theta divided by two pi x. So i one with respect to the x direction uh, is going to have as our theta, our sine theta is going to be sine ninety degrees equals one. And so we can see right here, I1 is going to equal 90 degrees. Um, I2 and I3, uh, the magnetic field in the x direction are I2 is going to be equal to UOI sine of 45 degrees. And so if this right here is 45 degrees, this is going to equal 45 degrees. And I3, UO, I sine 135 degrees. So if that is 90 and this is 45, 45 plus 90 is going to equal 135 degrees for I3. Uh, so I3 is going to equal UO, I sine 135 degrees divided by 2 pi x. And we need to remember that sine of 45 degrees equals sine of 135 degrees equals the square root of 2. Um, and you can note you can you can look at this and realize that um, 90 degrees plus 45 degrees equals 135 degrees. Um, so the magnetic field in the x direction equals the magnetic field uh, of the x components of I1 plus I2 plus I3. So the magnetic field in the x direction is going to equal U O I divided by 2 pi x. And so that was uh, from the first wire. And plus square root of 2 U O I divided by 2 pi x plus the square root of 2 UOI divided by 2 pi x, and that, that's from I2 and I3, which were equivalent. And so if we factor out our UOI divided by 2 pi x, we can see that the magnetic field in the x direction is UOI divided by 2 pi x plus times 1 plus uh, 2 times the square root of 2 because you had, uh, UO, you had I2 and I3 being equivalent. So, um, and that is going to equal answer C. Okay, that was another set of 10. We'll see you next time.